All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I know people are gonna be joining us as we kick off, um, have just a few introductory comments, but um, thank you all for joining us um, for this subject matter expert webinar, part of the Southeast Energy Insecurity Initiative. I am Jen Weiss. I'm a senior policy associate at the Nicholas Institute. We're part of um, Duke University. And um, I'm really excited about this project that we're working on in partnership with Appalachian Voices and the NC Justice Center um, to look at energy and security in the Southeast and really come up with some impactful um, recommendations for, for how we can overcome that and how we can reduce energy and security or improve energy security in the Southeast. So, as part of what we've been working on, um, we've been um, you know, having different working groups that have been talking about you know, specific recommendations and things that are happening outside of the Southeast. And so we thought it would be really good to bring together a couple of subject matter experts on percentage of income payment programs or PIP programs. This has come up quite a bit in our working groups, especially in the programs and finance working group. And so we wanted to kind of let the, lay the landscape a little bit about what PIP programs are, um, who um, some of the states that might be be either implementing them today or might be um, thinking about implementing them. And then I really wanted to have a really good discussion at the end about just, you know, let's talk about what it looks like for the Southeast and let's get some, some ideas out on the table. So this is going to be half of a kind of presentation from, from a panel and then um, a half a lot of you guys uh, giving us some, some of your thoughts and ideas. So welcome. Um, just a couple of logistical items. Um, you'll notice that the webinar will be recorded. So if you are not able to attend for the whole time or you wanna share it with a colleague or you wanna come back and watch it five times, please feel free to do that. Um, please keep your lines muted at this point. When we open it up for the group discussion, I think our, our group is gonna be small enough that we'll be able to unmute lines. So, uh, but just keep them muted for the first part of this. And then we will have plenty of time um, for you to ask questions and join the discussion. Um, if you do have a question along the way, um, I probably won't stop us until the end, but go ahead and use the chat function to ask your questions just to make sure that we have them in the queue and um, our panelists will be able to answer those at the end of um, after their presentations. So for those of you, I think many of you on the, the call actually are, are already involved with the Southeast Energy and Security Project, but for those of you that are not, it's a project that kicked off um, in January, yeah, January of this year. Um, and we have three objectives in mind or project goals. Um, we wanna measure and characterize the causes and impacts of energy burden and insecurity in the Southeast. We know it exists, but we wanna really measure it. We wanna characterize it. And we wanna tell the story of what is happening out there in our communities. Um, and then working together, we wanna devise regional and sustainable solutions to address energy insecurity in the Southeast. So we wanna come up with creative new ideas. We wanna to look to other regions and other parts of the country that might be doing some great things. What things can we be bringing to the Southeast to do here? And then finally, and I, I kind of find this one's the most important one to me anyway, is to foster regional collaboration amongst leaders in the energy and security efficiency and equity spaces. There are a lot of good people doing a lot of fantastic things. Um, and a lot of them on the call, you are on the call today. And just the ability to share stories, to share ideas, to ask questions of this, this network of collaborators, um, I think is a, a huge goal of this project. And I hope it continues on even after the project is over. So our agenda for today, um, after I do a couple introductions, um, we'll do a very quick, you know, you know, PIP 101, what is it and what problem is it trying to solve? But then I really wanted to get um, our two speakers uh, to tell a little bit of a story about their work with PIP um, in Illinois and in Virginia. Um, and at, following that, we'll have a, a larger group discussion to, to kind of talk about you know, your questions or things that we should be considering and thinking about as we start to, to frame a recommendation around this in the Southeast. So just quickly, um, you know, what is a PIP program, a percentage of income payment program? There's a lot of words here, but it really in, in, entails um, an enabling customers, particularly low income customers, to pay a predetermined or affordable percentage of their income towards their gas or electric service. Um, and so that those different levels are set by, by different states and, and our, our two speakers will talk to that. Um, it's, it's target benefits, uh, therefore ben target benefit levels to a, its income and not to anything else. So it's, it's really customized to each of the individuals about what their income is about, to determine what they can pay. Um, and then since separate billing and payment arrangements must be developed for each customer, as I just said, um, they generally entail a somewhat higher level of administrative complexity than straight discount rates, right? So that's something to consider when we're thinking about PIP programs is what type of administration are they going to um, require as we implement them? 
Um, recently, the, public, the Colorado Public Utilities Commission approved PIP for Excel Energy. Um, also, Illinois investor-owned utilities have implemented a PIP program. And then we've seen um, pro program models um, that have been operative for years in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maine, um, just to name a few. So it's happening today. There are PIP programs that are out there. Some of them are a little bit different than others, but the main part of it is that they, um, they, they have a you know, predetermined amount of income or percentage of income that each of the customers pays. Um, so I wanted to uh, just turn it over to people who know a lot more about it than I do, um, to people that have been part of the programs and um, financing a working group team. Um, Dan Jarenko is from the Tennessee Interfaith Power and Light. Um, Dan is the coordinator um, for, for the Tennessee Interfaith Power and Light. He also coordinates the creation care ministry of the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. And he was a founder of the National Earth Keepers Program hosted through United Methodist Global Ministries. He has a PhD in resource development from Michigan State University. And he also has a Master of Divinity degree from Garrett Evangelical Theological School. So welcome, Dan. And then Carmen Bingham um, has worked in state government advocacy for much of her career. Um, she is the Affordable Clean Energy Project Leader for the Virginia Poverty Law Center Project. Um, she, before joining the Virginia Poverty Law Center, she was the Chief of Staff for the Minority Leader in the House of Delegates, an aide to another House of Delegates member, a coordinator with the League of Conservation Voters, and staff at the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. So she's worked in this for, for years. And so I welcome both of you. I'm really excited um, to hear more about your work with PIP and uh, to have the discussion later. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to Dan. Well, welcome everybody. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, at least that's what it feels like, uh, the beginnings of energy justice. I was consider myself being there uh, this was a little bit before my time in the early 1980s, uh, out of our organizing of some of these community organizations in Chicago, the model for the LIHE program uh, was passed in Illinois and became a national model. And in 1985, uh, we were able to get the first uh, PIP program, we designed and got the first PIP program uh, passed in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. We were really organized for community problem solving. Uh, the organization I worked for, uh, Northwest Community Organization, was a 20-year-old organization on the near Northwest side of Chicago. We had moderate income homeowners and low income renters uh, working together for the common good. Um, very, I think a very sophisticated model of organizing. Uh, in, in the most segregated city in the United States, uh, we had one census tract that was one third uh, white, one third black, and one third Latino. Um, our West Side Coalition working with Austin, uh, we basically got redlining outlawed and got the Community Reinvestment Act passed, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and billions reinvested in communities, moderate in and low income communities across the United States. And one of the last things I worked on in the 1990s was our industrial policy collaboration between factory owners, unions, community groups, where we were able to maintain over 12,000 community-based industrial jobs for the community. So again, we took problems. We weren't a protest organization so much, and we weren't a single issue organization. Uh, we really delved deeply into the problems uh, facing our community and came up with uh, model solutions. Uh, next slide. So PIP, it starts with care and crisis. Uh, it starts with care, uh, the injunction from scripture to love your neighbor as yourself, uh, that we care for those, uh, particularly those who are facing hardship. But also crisis in the early 1980s, uh, there was a recession and there were well over 100,000 households uh, that faced utility, that were shut off in Illinois over the course of a year, over 100,000 shutoffs. And you can imagine what it's like being in Chicago in January without heat. It's, it's also a city with major heat waves. And so there's not a lot of air conditioning in Chicago, at least in those days, but, you know, not even having fans, you can imagine that. And so it was a, it was a life or death kind of situation for a lot of families, or at least, a, a, a you know, a, a severe you know, hardship to go without uh, heat or uh, cooling in these times. 
And so part of this is just remembering the households and the people uh, that we're dealing with in terms of care. And one of the things that we did was we heard people's stories. Uh, the Illinois Commerce Commission who um, regulates the utilities agreed to have public hearings in three of our communities where people told their stories about heat shutoffs. And perhaps the best example, the impact uh, of these stories, uh, I drove around uh, one Saturday morning in January with the, the chair of the Illinois Commerce Commission, Phil O'Connor, and we visited folks whose heat was shut off. Um, it deeply moved him, it, it really deeply moved him. I think it was the moment where he moved from skepticism towards our proposed program uh, to support of the program. And I also learned that uh, Mr. O'Connor shared uh, interest with me in traditional Irish music. So that was a nice bonus of that moment. Uh, next slide. It also came out of combining community experience with policy experience, the experience that we had in the community uh, of, of, of the folks, uh, including folks involved in uh, de designing the initial program uh, facing shutoffs, and also policy expertise. Uh, Professor uh, Stefan Krieger of the Mandel Legal Aid Clinic at the University of Chicago provided our, you know, our policy assistance and our legal assistance in all of this. And out of this tremendous crisis we were facing in the community with households being shut off, um, we came up with the idea that uh, low-income people could pay a percentage of income for their gas and for the lights. And uh, the percentage that we came up with at the time was 12%, 8% for gas and 4% for electricity. Uh, next slide. We launched an extensive campaign. Uh, first, uh, uh, essentially a case at the Illinois Commerce Commission, which was composed of four Republicans at the time and three Democrats who was appointed by the governor. And uh, we would pack the public hearings and provide a, a case for uh, this, 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 the PIP program. Uh, and eventually it passed the Illinois Commerce Commission, uh, but with a kind of a caveat that people were still responsible for what's called the shortfall, the difference between the 12% and their bills. And there was a payment program to pay that off, but it was putting a burden on people. And so we got it also then introduced into the state legislature as legislation. And it initially passed the, both the House and the Senate, uh, essentially on party lines, uh, Democrats in favor, Republicans against. Uh, it was then amended. Uh, the governor, Jim Thompson, came up with funding uh, to pay the shortfall. Uh, this was through, at that time, oil overcharge funds. The, you know, the, the state had, and customers of Illinois had been overcharged by oil companies. And there was a case and there, there was about $90 million uh, that we could put towards energy needs. And it was put towards this program with a three-year sunset. And I'm showing Governor Thompson there. Uh, he was a moderate Republican. He passed away this past year. But he was our greatest champion for the program. He secured the funding and he finally lobbied the floor of uh, the Illinois legislature on the day of the final vote. And we had uh, 10 strong Republicans uh, vote for the plan. And so it was a bipartisan effort and then eventually it was bipartisan in the House also. And that's uh, Governor Thompson at our NCO annual convention. He came there uh, later that year. Uh, we were celebrating him for his support. And we also pressed him on some housing issues and some other things. Uh, and so it was a very gracious moment uh, and, a, and a wonderful moment there. And that's Lucy Soto, our, our president and one of our leaders of the campaign. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, it had a three-year sunset, and so the governor appointed a task force of community leaders, policy experts, utility representatives, and bipartisan legislatures. There was a lot of opposition towards this program by some of the utilities initially, particularly Commonwealth Edison, I think concerned about uh, how it was going to work economically. Uh, but this task force really found that this program was working well. And uh, 
They, they developed a way to fund it through uh, the LIHEAP program and it passed through consent uh, unanimously through the state legislature. So there was no opposition uh, to the program uh, when it was re-upped. And so uh, the next slide, it worked. And so it's a matter of designing a sustainable program. Unfortunately though, we were, I think, way ahead of our time. And so later in the mid 1990s, uh, the program went out of existence for a while because of some severe cutbacks in, in LIHEAP funds coming into Illinois. Uh, it was then um, a new version of the program was passed through the state legislature in 2009. Uh, there's currently five investor owned utilities, including the largest. And again, Commonwealth Edison, a supporter and participant in the program, uh, People's Gas, uh, the provider of gas in Chicago. The way it works is when you apply for LIHEAP, you have a choice of a direct payment or a monthly payment under PIP. And under PIP, the utility bills of low-income households are paid in the following ways. First, clients pay 6% of their gross income towards utility bills. Second, they receive a monthly LIHEAP benefit to cover uh, the rest of their bill up to $100 on the primary account with $50 on the secondary account. And third, if clients pay their portion of the bill, then uh, some of the previous past due payment is, is, pay, is uh, basically paid off or forgiven. And then that goes into um, kind of one twelfth of that. And so it's a 12 month program. Uh, it's, there are around 25,000 households in Illinois on the program, at least the most recent statistics I could find. There's 40, a uh, million of LIHEAP allocated to this uh, recently, about 25 million of that has been spent. So that's about $1,000 per year per LIHEAP, uh, per, per participant in the program, about $1,000 a year per participant. And the maximum LIHEAP payments in Illinois is $1,250. And uh, about 5% are in missed payment status about 5%. So it's working for 95% of these people. And for whatever reason, about 5% are in missed payment status. Uh, next slide. And I, I, I believe it's a better service model for utilities. Uh, it's my experience with utility executives and managers. Uh, they have a justifiable pride in providing a vital service, providing a vital service of heat, cooling, lights that are just essential for us. And all, there's all that that goes into such a complex endeavor. Uh, and it's something, again, that I feel justified pride in. But it presents a real problem to not be able to provide this service to those with limited means. And administrative and field staff are devoted to limiting the service rather than providing the service. People cycle in and out of reconnection status and connection status, uh, unco uncollected debt, and just all the, all the difficulties of, of, of dealing with this and, and trying to meet people's needs, but also people without means to pay. And so instead with the PIP program, I believe that administrative and field staff time could be devoted towards providing the service, uh, not eliminating service. And as, as we discuss this, and need to design a model that works both for low-income households and for the utilities as well as possibly uh, state government agencies and, and community agencies that are involved. And so again, uh, uh, you know, the details, they, they are important, but overall I believe that the PIP program is a better model, uh, better service model for utilities. Uh, next slide. And uh, finally, it can achieve justice promote fairness and again, caring for neighbors. Um, we, we all know uh, there are, are large scale, um, long standing racial wealth disparities in this country. And so, um, you know, people with limited means are disproportionately uh, people of color. It promotes fairness and it pay what you are able. And it's, it's my experience in talking with this across people across the political spectrum. Uh, this seems fair. Uh, you're not just giving away money, but you're uh, essentially 
people are paying as if they're able. And, and that, that seems fair to people. And finally, uh, this great call to care for our neighbors, because again, focusing not just on the statistics, but the real lived stories. And, you know, I, I carry that with me the rest of my life, you know, that uh, this, this close contact and close interaction and close um, proximity to people who were struggling uh, to pay their bills, but also the great inspiration that came from people joining together um, both within the community and across the political spectrum in Illinois uh, to get the first uh, PIP program passed through. And again, uh, it's, it's, it's a model, you know, a model type of program uh, for the nation, I believe. So thank you. And uh, that's my presentation. Great. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, so that is the story of Illinois and very, very well told. Thank you, Dan, for that. And um, now we wanted to move over to Virginia, which hasn't actually implemented the program yet, but there's been a lot of work behind what the implementation looks like. And so Carmen's going to kind of walk us through that. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Dan. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I off mute? Yes. You are perfect. Yep. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm Carmen Bingham. I'm with the Virginia uh, Poverty Law Center based out of Richmond, Virginia. We are the uh, low income advocacy group that works to break down systemic barriers that keep uh, low income Virginians in the cycle of poverty. Um, I'm sorry, Jen, go ahead and flip to the next slide. We have been working on energy issues for a number of years now, but only most recently really started to get back into the, the energy world here in Virginia um, with our affordable clean energy project, was, which was really initially to focus on improving and in increasing the number of utility sponsored energy efficiency programs in Virginia. And of course, as we started looking into this, um, as with anything energy related, we find that it is a complicated uh, web that has been weaved regardless of whether it's regulatory or non-regulatory and there are many things that touch it. So if you can go to the next slide, one of the things that we did was actually commission um, and worked with the Green Lake Group out of Atlanta, Georgia to map out what Virginia's electricity burden looked like. And just going by zip codes through Virginia, this is the map that was, that was produced from looking at where our electricity burden is. Uh, Virginia has two large investor owned utilities, Dominion and Appalachian Power, which is part of the American um, electric power um, conglomerate, as well as a little tiny slice um, of, of service down in the, the very tippity tip point of uh, Southwest Virginia that down there, um, which is operated by Kentucky utilities. Um, but then we also have um, electric cooperatives and municip municipality electric um, organizations um, throughout the, uh, the Commonwealth. But as you can see from this map, there is a large swath of Virginia that is overburdened just on electricity. That does, this does not take into account gas, heat, or any other type of energy. It's, this is just electricity. And as we looked at this map, we realized that, um, first of all, Virginia has a higher than average um, electricity burden than the nation. Virginia sits at 3.1%, while the national average, again, just for electricity burden is 2.7%. But as we looked at the localities that this map was representing in the, in the pink to coral to red, we recognized that these localities were actually experiencing energy burdens um, one, one locality actually has an energy burden of up to 25%, but they were, they were basically hovering in the teens. So down there in the Southwest Virginia area, we're looking at an 18.2%. Um, you move over into the South, a uh, little bit East to the, to the kind of mid uh, South side area, you're looking at 13.9%. You go over further towards the East and we're looking at 14.9%. And then up into Petersburg and Richmond, you're looking at a 12.9%. This is significantly higher than the 2.7 nationally, never mind the 3.1 in Virginia. So next slide, please. So as we were looking at this, we decided that we needed to, we, I began researching specifically 
other programs in other states that were actually addressing the cost of electricity for consumers. And uh, I came upon the, the PIP programs in a bunch of other states and some of the utilities that are operating them and realized that PIP was probably a really good model that we could use and uh, redesign for Virginia uh, specifically to address this issue. However, always being mindful of the political winds here in Virginia, we realized that something needed to change. And we are not an organization that delves into politics, nor do we, uh, we, we do not campaign for anybody. We're, we're, we're strictly agnostic when it comes to that. But at the same time I was, I was redoing this research on PIP, there was a shift of the politics here in Virginia. And in the fall of 2009, all 140 seats of our legislature were up for election. And we had at that time a Republican held majority, but it was very slim, both in our House of 100, which was 5149, and our Senate of 40, which was 2119. After those fall elections, everything switched. We already had um, our executive branch was being held by Democrats. And now we had a full democratic legislature with a 45-55 split in the house. And then the 1921, they just flipped that chamber um, in the Senate. And we recognized that we actually had a far more receptive audience for something like a PIP program. At the same time, many of our colleagues who work on the, on the carbon, in the carbon reduction world uh, recognized that they had an opportunity to really push forward some clean energy priorities um, through the legislature. We had our delegate Lamont Bagney, who's based out of Richmond here, carry our initial Virginia PIP legislation. It was a standalone bill. It was just about PIP. As the, pro as the session progressed, the omnibus bills for the Clean Energy Act that really encompassed, encompassed all clean energy related projects and policy carried by Delegate uh, Richard Sullivan and Senator Jen McClellan, uh, we had companion bills in both the House and the Senate on that, was moving forward, but it was recognized that moving in towards a clean energy economy that there were gonna be some issues for some of our low income families and, and our moderate income families and that there needed to be some protections put in place in order to help mitigate some of those, um, those increased costs for this transition, you know, to move us into this transition. And it became recognized that we really needed to include the PIP uh, legislation in that piece of legislation. Uh, so that's what they did. They swept aside our bill and then just scooped it all up and put it in the Omnibus Clean Energy Act. Bills. And it did collect support for the clean energy bills. And if but for that, for that PIP legislation included in there, they may not have gotten some of the votes that they needed in order to pass that legislation. So next slide, please. So some of the fundamentals that we wanted to make sure that were originally in our bill, and then we made sure we're in the, the legislation as it was written for the Clean Energy Act, was to address three fundamental basics. The first is to address the energy burden for the customer themselves. And, and in doing so, that's where you limit the payment for their electric service to no more than a percentage of their income. For us, we determined that at this point, 6%, if they do not heat with electricity and 10%, if they did, it's kind of a, a, a compromise position, if you will, um, an amount to, to address Virginia's high energy use, but also the high energy burden. And, um, and the fact that we are a little bit higher in terms of income levels in Virginia. So we went with the 6% and the 10%. The second basic element is to make sure that the utility is made whole. So while the individual customer is only paying six or 10% of their income towards their utility bill, their electric bill, the utility still has that balance on their books. And so in order to make sure that they are made whole on that account, there is a universal service fee that is charged to all utility customers, to all of the utilities customers, that will allow the utility to recoup that unpaid portion. Um, that universal service fee also collects enough to cover the administrative costs for this, uh, for this program. 
um, and it can, it can cover other things, but that's what it's going to do in Virginia. The third thing that we wanted to do was make sure that we eliminated any um, energy usage waste. So by making sure that we, um, we provide an opportunity for the customers that are enrolled in PIP to actually participate in energy efficiency programs, energy conservation programs, energy ed conservation education programs on ways that they can you know, change some behaviors maybe um, or take advantage of other programs that are available to reduce their usage without changing their, their, um, their life comfort, basically. Because you know, This isn't the 70s of where we, you know, we're just talking conservation where you turn down the heat and throw on you know, three or four coats. We want people to be comfortable in their homes. And, and we, we also recognize that we have a lot more electricity, a lot more gadgets in our homes that pull on electricity. So we can't just eliminate those use. We need to figure out a way to be more efficient with how we use our electricity, but with the gadgets that, we are, that are using the electricity too. So we wanna make sure that we coordinate and collaborate with agencies, uh, localities and nonprofits, wherever we have programs available at no cost to low income folks, because uh, this is specifically for low income families, uh, that can actually reduce the amount of electricity that they use um, in the course of their normal life, life, life um, daily life experiences. Um, and we're not subsidizing waste, essentially. You know, the universal service fee is not paying for electric waste. It's not paying for the leaky roof. It's not paying for the, you know, the energy that's seeping out of the, the, the unsealed windows. It's, it's actually paying for energy that they're using. So we want to make sure that these three basic fundamentals um, are, are included in any program that we design. As Jen said, we are only just now starting to get into the development of our actual PIP program. Uh, we just had a special session because most states, we had the ARPA funds come down and we had to have a special session to um, you know, be able to disperse those funds. So our administrating ag administrative agency is the Department of Social Services, and they got a lot of um, assistance money and a lot of programs that they've got us kind of stand up now. Uh, so PIP is just another one of those programs that we've got to get up and running. So they're a little little behind on their timeline, but they are they are working as fast as they can to get this going. We we are hoping. Um, you know, our original goal was to get this up and running and get people enrolled in October of 2022. I think realistically now we're probably looking at May, April for the uh, 2023 season, but we'll do what we can to get us going there. There's still a lot of things that we have to look at, and, and I'm happy to answer some questions when we get into the discussion on that. But this is the very basic of PIP, that if anyone is, is looking to do a PIP program, these to me are like the fundamental things that we want to make sure the PIP program is designed to address. And then all of the other lessons that we can learn from all of the other programs that are in operation right now, you know, can be addressed depending upon how utilities are set up, how the regulatory process works, um, what, kind of, what kind of other resources are available and can be accessed for low-income families. Um, but that's, this is the basic. So last slide, Jen. Um, obviously, again, thank you. Uh, really would love to chat and hear more from people about their experiences with PIP, as well as if anybody has any questions about the PIP program itself. Wonderful. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, so we have the, the two bookends, right? One that started back in 1985 and one that's still under development. You can see that, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the two, but there's also been some things that have changed along the years as well as we've learned more. So, um, so thank you both, Dan and Carmen, um, for those, for both of those um, stories and telling us more about the programs in the states with, with, within which you work. Um, wanted to just now pause and, and just do either um, questions for um, Dan and Carmen, or um, we could start a group discussion. I do see a couple in the chat, so we might start with those. Um, oh, good question. So Chris Woolery, Carmen, wanted to know, um, what is the projected universal service fee? Do you know that yet? Uh, we do. As a matter of fact, and I apologize, I do believe that our reports came out, but this has been... The, and I'm glad you asked that question because this has been the hardest thing for us getting started in Virginia. You know, programs that have been underway, they've got the whole formula on how you figure out what your universal service fee rate is going to be based on the numbers that, 
you know, you've, you've had and, you know, what the participant rate, participation rates are, and then you can do a, a, you know, a projection from there. In Virginia, the problem that we've had has been that there is a set of data that is housed with utilities, and then there is a set of data that is housed with our Department of Social Services. And those two data sets need to be mixed, but they can't be mixed, right? Um, utilities don't want to know the, the income levels in, the, in the, 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 the customers that they have that are considered to be um, public benefits eligible or anything like that. And quite frankly, the Department of Social Services is overwhelmed enough that they don't need another data set for them to figure out who are, you know, who are uh, Dominion customers, who are APCO customers, who are cooperative customers, um, and whether or not, you know, they're, they have an arrearage with the utility or anything like that. You know, they do enough with the home heating, um, the, the home energy assistance uh, plans that they have, the, the actual dollar assistance cash assistance that they get twice a year to be able to help with the utilities for folks. But, you know, that's a lot of customers. I mean, Dominion alone is expecting about 118,000 of their customers to be eligible for PIP. So this is a whole nother, whole nother group of people that um, while DSS may, be, may already be dealing with a lot of them, it, it's still a new, new, new set of customers, uh, a new set of clients, so to speak. So how you figure out what that initial universal service fee should be is really complicated. And it's a best guess that uh, both APCO and Dominion have, have filed in through their applications for the program through our regulatory commission. And what we ended up doing was because we, we specifically said in the legislation and then we, we uh, made it clear last year in 2021, this past year, um, that this universal service fee needed to be set and collected right away is that we've determined what the cost would be to set up this program. And that's basically the administrative cost for the administrative agency, which in, in again, in Virginia is the Department of Social Services. And the Department of Social Services came up with a figure of $3 million is what they needed in order to get the proper staff, to get the proper um, uh, technology uh, needs that they had, all of that in order to get this program up and running and, and to be able to actually enroll people. And so of that $3 million, that's where we figured they agreed, um, Dominion and APCO, Dominion basically agreed that they would, they would fit, fit, foot 2.4 million of that or 2.8 million, I'm sorry, basically two thirds of that for their customer base because they do have a larger customer base in Virginia than APCO does. And then APCO would put the, uh, the remaining amount of that. And so that is what the first universal service rate fee is. Now, six months into the program, we will have some data that will show how many people have been, have been signed up, what their, what their monthly bills look like. So we know a little bit more about where they're gonna be able to pay versus what's gonna have to be covered by the universal service fee. And math will have to be done from there to figure out and projections, figure out what we believe will need to be the universal service fee. But all of that will come out through a regulatory hearing and will be provided through, you know, both filings based on DSS's figures that come out, the utilities figures that then come out about their customer base that enrolls in PIP and where they need to be in terms of how much is actually gonna to need to be recovered from the universal service fee. So it's a, it's a lot you're gonna to have to look at and think about before you actually start and having this basically two years, year and a half, two years, um, gives us that time to be able to get it set up and then start to look at some better data um, that'll be coming available as we move forward in this process. Great, fantastic detailed answer that was that's no that's really really helpful as as the other groups are starting to think through what this could look like in their states um mm -hmm. so and i'm assuming that first um universal service fee was already approved the one for the administration costs or is that yes. a pending yes. okay so that one's yeah. already been yeah okay. that one's been done great thank you um so the next question is uh, about the terms of the pip um how long is someone on pip that might be for you or for dan or both so from what i've seen and what i've researched i mean people are on PIP for as long as they need to be on PIP. So long as your payment, monthly payment is still less than what your uh, 
bill is on an annual basis. I mean, you just don't want to kick people on and off PIP from month to month. Really, you want to look at this at an annual basis and, and figure that, you know, kind of parcel that out. Um, you want to keep people on there for as long as they need it because, you know, you, you need to make sure that people are, it has to be sustainable. This can't be a one and done, like we're going to help you this month, but next month you're going to have to struggle. Um, which is why for us in Virginia, it was really important that we look at energy efficiency, energy conservation. Um, we're actually under the development of a shared solar subscription program here too, that's going to be just in Dominion's territory. So looking at that as a potential um, program that we can enroll low-income subscribers in, low-income families in to help reduce that energy cost. But anything that we can do to sustainably reduce and keep their bills low and affordable um, is where we need to be. Um, there is some, there is some um, such as Ohio, which was the model that I really um, fell in love with, to be honest. Um, there is an arrearage piece to it where if you come into the PIP program with an arrearage, there is a whole process by which you go through where you stay in PIP for as long as you have this arrearage and keep your payments uh, current and um, and you get credit for you know a twelfth of your arrearage that you owe uh, that gets wiped out because it's recovered through the universal service fee because you're doing your part um, and I can talk in detail about that later but but honestly they they keep people on there for as long as they need them to be and I think um, one of the other things that you want to make sure that you're coupling this with is a budget billing plan. You know, most utilities do have a budget billing plan. So if you've got a customer who's got a, a history, a long enough history to be able to establish budget billing, that is going to help set wherever your um, comparison is for your 6% or 10% or whatever the percent is that you settle on for your, your PIP program um, and do a comparison to see, you know, is the budget amount under that 6% or under that percentage or, you know, or do they need to pay that 6% because it's lower than that budget amount, budgeted amount in terms of their history. And this is why the administrative cost for these programs is a little bit higher because it really is individualized. It's, it's dependent upon the family, their usage, and also where they're living. Yep. And as Carmen said, yeah, I, I would agree with everything Carmen said. And it, it really does it works, as Carmen said earlier too, it works best for very low income people. Uh, and uh, again, a number of households kind of um, go in and then out of poverty as people get work and such, and then, then you would switch off the PIP program. Uh, but it does provide a really important regularity uh, for very low income people. And again, uh, if you're very low income, um, that percentage, you know, allows you to keep keep your utilities on. Uh, at a certain point, you know, it, it just becomes unpayable, and so it gives that kind of regularity. So yes, you you want to keep people on as as long as uh, it's benefiting them essentially. And uh, again, the way that the program is structured. Um, yeah, it, 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 it works that way. But again, there's, you know, it, it, it's kind of an individualized program. And, uh, you know, it, it's not for everybody who is in low income status. Uh, but again, particularly for uh, the poorest of the poor, uh, elderly folk or, or folk with particular struggles of one kind or another, uh, it, it seems to, to work very well. Great. Right. And, and so, you know, kind of a, a similar um, question, um, you know, once weatherization is done, whether it's done through LIHEAP or through a, you know, a utility program or something else, um, does that end the PIP program or is it, is it what you both were saying? Oh, yeah, they'll stay on it as long as they need it, even with the weatherization um, uh, measures that are done to their homes. In an ideal world, right? Like, like in our perfect world, you know, you weatherize somebody's home, oh, wow, their energy becomes, you know, energy becomes affordable. But that isn't always the case. So yes, they would stay in the PIP program so long as their energy bills are still above that threshold of the six, 10, 
you know, for whatever percentage is that you set for your program. Wonderful. Okay, so that were all the, the official questions that we had. Um, I just threw out, and these this was all Jen Weiss um, throwing these out, different ideas or, or topics that we could be discussing um, that I've heard from, from other stakeholders, um, whether there are any additional regulatory legislative considerations. Um, Carmen, you certainly went through quite a, quite a few that you guys considered um, for the Virginia program, but there are there other things that some of the other South, Southeast states should be considering, um, including energy efficiency and demand response. Obviously, you know, I, I think you're building that into the Virginia program and that's, that's something that the, the state should be looking at. Are mm -hmm. there any consumer protections that are needed um, that we should be thinking through as we start to think about developing these? And you mentioned data needs already, you know, what kind of data needs are, are, are necessary in order to, to calculate that universal service fee and to make sure um, that we're providing the, the service. There's certainly others. Um, I'm gonna take us off of the, um, the, the shared and just let us all look at each other so that you all can ask questions. And I open this up for discussion. What's on your minds? I will say that um, one of the things you have to be careful with, because we we kind of made this mistake as we were going ahead, but you know we learned right away and we adjusted, is you cannot require the energy efficiency or energy conservation programs as a condition of uh, enrollment in the program. However, you can do as we're doing, which is enroll folks and then say, look, this is part of the program is to learn about energy efficiency, learn about energy conservation and have a better understanding of the, the cause and effect of your energy use with your energy bill. And so enrolling them, you know, getting them to agree to enroll in first an energy audit in order to, to see what kind of energy efficiency uh, measures can be installed to actually reduce their energy bills in the first place and be able to show them, look, you know, just by sealing that window, we reduced your energy bill, you know, an extra five bucks a month, which for some people, that's a lot of money. But, but if they, if, if, if first you don't start that education program right away to help with the understanding of, of, you know, having extra lights on in the house, having all of these appliances plugged in at the same time, doing your laundry in the middle of the day, as opposed to doing your laundry, you know, overnight, um, you know, there is a correlation between your use and what your energy bill looks like and helping that and helping finding ways to reduce that, that, uh, that usage without changing your lifestyle really is important. Yeah. And yeah, weatherization programs have benefits is everybody on this call probably knows that go well beyond the just the energy burden to help things. In fact, it was our original, I didn't mention this, but it was our original vision and the original plan that passed through the state legislature. <laughs> if we were going to look to weatherize all the homes of the people on the project, but uh, that seemed to be too inexpensive of a lift at that time for some of the legislature. So that didn't make the, the three year sunset. Well, I think Reverend Woodbury, are you, are you trying to ask a question? I, I was thinking, um, yeah, and this is really an awesome program. And, and, you know, we've been looking at what's been going on with Ohio and Virginia. Yesterday, we were actually on a, a call with some Virginia legislators and looking at, you know, how, does, how, how would this work in states like South Carolina? Um, but I'm kind of looking at when we say the very core, you mm -hmm. know, how inclusive is that going to be? So if we have people who, and we have a lot of people who work in the restaurant industry, they're making $2.40 an hour plus tips. And so if they have children and, and they're bringing home, you know, an average $200 a week and their energy bill is $150. Uh, a month, you know, and then on top of that, they have child care and a car note, and they have to pay their cell phone bill and others. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of concerned that we don't set the bar um, too high when we do when we limit limit it. I, I'm I'm trying to figure out what exactly is the poorest of the poor when we have people like that, and I know we just were sitting in uh, uh, as an advisory group with the uh, city of Florence 10 year comprehensive plan. And out of the 38,000 people in the city, 
40% of our, our citizens are renters, and many of them are paying as much as 30% of their income mm -hmm. on, on utility costs. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to get, I, I know the whole thing about 6%. Um, the 8%, but we have a lot of folks who are paying more than th of that in utility costs. And I, when you look at the, um, the, the uh, federal uh, poverty uh, level, you know, exactly where, where do these people fit in, 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 the, in that part of the plan? So I'm, I'm kind of wondering when we talk about the poorest of the poor, what are we talking about? 200%, 300% of the federal poverty li limit and, um, and um, you know, what additional financial burdens do people have that, um, you, you understand what I'm saying? So I, I know we're just working this out, but I, I just have some questions about what group actually encompasses the poorest of the poor? Well, I will tell you this, Reverend Woodbury, and that's a really good question. It, you know, when we initially started with our PIP program, we have VPLC, we work with folks who are anywhere from, uh, uh, anywhere up to 400% of federal poverty, right? Mm -hmm. And really for us, the struggling families are the ones that are two to 400%, because most public benefits programs you know, the, the SNAP benefits, for example, they go up to 180% of federal poverty level for income qualification. So most public benefits programs cut off at the, you know, anywhere from the 150 to 200%. And so the really struggling people are the two to 400%. So we wanted to try and encompass them. Unfortunately, politics comes into play and we have to start somewhere. We we uh, compromised and said that we would agree to people uh, qualifying for this program would be those who make 150% of that poverty level or below. So that is where we're starting. And, and we're hoping that the data will, will reveal and show that we can expand this program to those who might be, you know, 250 to 300% of poverty level at some point. Okay, and we appreciate we appreciate your gaze, which you know is actually a model that we're hoping to replicate in South Carolina. Well, we'll we'll do everything we can to help. Okay, great question and great observation, and I think that is something that we're going to have to continue you know, just to discuss. Trying to point. Yeah, and when I and Reverend Woodbury, a good question, and when I. You know, when I said the poor, so the poor, it's partly if you're about a 10% program, at some point that PIP goes above, for certain families, it goes above, uh, you know, your utility bills. And so, but as you, as Carmen mentioned, and as you mentioned, there are also a lot of folks out there that are, uh, you know, and that, as Carmen said, that two to 400%. And so then, is it a PIP program or is it, do you need some other type of program to address that particular need? And, and that's an important question, I think, because, yeah, because again, a lot of those folks are really struggling too. Thank you. Good. Thank you, thank you, great, great question. Um, Natasha, you've been very patient. What's your question, observation? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for having this today. Um, you know, uh, I represent the South Carolina Association of Community Action Partnerships. And of course, community action in South, well, in many places across the U.S., particularly in South Carolina, has the LIHEAP program. And so I really appreciate the history or hearing the history from its inception um, from someone who was there. And I'd probably like to speak with you a little bit more about that later on, just to get some more of that information for our purposes. Um, second of all, and forgive me if I missed something because I had to take a phone call in the middle of the presentations. But I was just wondering, with regard to these, are you all partnering with Community Action in your states um, to make sure that they're weatherizing the homes of the poorest of the poor? That way you can reserve some of those resources for um, people who are above 200% of the poverty lines. So yes, Natasha, that um, good question. And yes, the, the whole idea of the Virginia program, and that was actually the third basic point that the Virginia program wanted to address, and that was to reduce energy usage and, and actually improve the efficiency of the, the electricity that was being used. 
And so utilizing weatherization, utility sponsored energy efficiency programs, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're under the development of a shared solar subscription program for low income. It's actually shared solar for everybody, but there's a low income subscription piece to that. Um, and utilizing all of those programs in order to minimize the amount of energy that is being used and thus needs to be paid for by that customer. Um, so the more we can, the more we can find ways to actually reduce that that initial cost for them, the better off not just that family is, but then the rest of the utility payers um, that would cover through the universal service fee. Absolutely. So um, besides the weatherization programs that are mostly through community action, I believe in the U.S., are there any other similar programs that are being sponsored by, say, for instance, the government or um, our local utilities also doing weatherization in Virginia? Um, here in Virginia, they don't do weatherization. I mean, they do, like Dominion has their energy share program, which is sort of a weatherization program, but um, but it's it's funded by their their shareholders. So it's it's got a little bit more um, flexibility to it than, than the federal weatherization, right? Uh, but we also have utility sponsored energy efficiency programs that are not weatherization say, but definitely have some of the same energy efficiency measures offered through those programs as the weatherization program. And the same providers, the same, yeah, the same providers that are part of our weatherization network here in Virginia, the same contractors also do the utility sponsored ones. So they work really hard to make sure to put the, that puzzle together to figure out what the best combination of programs is to get the maximum benefit at the least cost for those at the least cost for the provider and for the utility and their, therefore the utility customers that are paying for the programs for that household, because these are all no cost programs for the low income families. And final question, um, I was wondering, I'm a big proponent of using technology, particularly technology you can use on your phones because a lot of our customers have access to the internet through their phones. And so um, we are big fans of the Energy Saver program that our uh, South Carolina Energy Office has with ORS in South Carolina. And we're also big fans of some of the, the Energy Saver tools that um, the companies themselves, the energy companies themselves will come up with. And they found that there is a lot of change in customer behavior and in their energy usage because they're able to monitor their own usage and see it in real time. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you all are utilizing that as well. Uh, uh, let's let's stay tuned. Um, I, that is a bigger problem in Virginia than I um, would really like to share with this whole group right now. But Natasha, I'd love to talk with you about that offline. That is something Virginia can learn. Okay, let's just put it that way. Um, we've we've been having a struggle uh, getting our utilities to really. Um, embrace this technology. Uh, it's not that they don't want to, we've just had a fight between the utilities, the regulatory commission and advocates to, to really come to an agreement on, on what, the, what the best avenue is for that at the least cost. So we've, we, we're a little behind when it comes to that technology use. We've got some customers that do use it because the utilities have specific tariffs that they can, um, that, that their customers can engage in like on a time of use pilot that they've had. We've got a smart meter pilot that they have um, for Dominion. Um, we have one cooperative that has nothing but smart meters, um, but not everybody has a smart meter in Virginia. And um, it's it's been a struggle, but I, I'm happy to go through the, the dirty details with you on that offline. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate both of you. All right. Thank you. I David's had his hand raised for a while. So David, I want to give you a chance. I know we're at four o'clock, but David, um, if you still are on, uh, go ahead and ask. Yeah, this will be very quick. I'm, I'm excited about the, all this. I wanted to particularly let Reverend Woodbury and Natasha know that as part of a, a rate case settlement in the recent Dominion Energy South Carolina rate case, we got a commitment from the utility to, to start a stakeholder process to, to, to consider a percentage of income payment plan with arrearage management. So I'd love to engage with both of you and other South Carolina advocates around trying to make sure that actually happens. 
Um, and we also got a commitment of $15 million of shareholder dollars to go into critical health and safety repairs and energy efficiency for low income residents in their service territory in South Carolina. So we're really excited about that. They're gonna cooperate with the OEO office in South Carolina, um, as long as it doesn't jeopardize their federal allocation. So there's still some details to be worked out there. Well, if it does jeopardize their federal allocations, please be sure to talk to us because we're the advocacy yeah. office and we actually are an alternative. So, right. um, and plus we already sit on the, the Energy Advisory Council for Dominion. Yeah. Great. 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 We're interested, just contact us. We'll be we'll glad do. to engage. As a matter of fact, I should mention that we already handled the Duke Weatherization Energy Program because um, it, it jeopardizes the federal allocation for OEO. And so the other agencies can't handle it. So we're doing that throughout the entire Duke territory um, in the north part of South Carolina. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's good. That, congratulations, David. That's great news on Dominion. I didn't realize that was happening. So we're, we'll watch closely as that's getting developed as well. Um, so um, it, it, we are past four. I really appreciate you guys all joining the call. Thank you to Carmen and to Dan for, for jumping on and sharing their expertise. I know, um, like I said, you know, the, the collaborations that we're forming here as we continue to, in each of our states, look at um, something like a PIP program. I think we can continue to have conversations like this. I'm happy to, to help to facilitate them as well if we wanna continue to learn from each other as, as all of these programs move forward. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions and I can hopefully get them to the right expert. Again, I'm not the expert, but there are a bunch on the call today. And um, thank you all so much for, for being a part of the Energy and Security Initiative. Um, have a great rest of your day.